I've been reading over the weekend. So I've been reading this, The Secret DJ by The Secret DJ, book number one, right? Um, I'm still waiting for book number two. I actually ordered book number two on pre-order, but it's now going to arrive in January sometime, which is annoying. So then I thought, rags, let me get book number two, book number one, sorry, and just read that before book number two comes And Judging by the date, it's going to arrive in January. I'll probably be able to finish this by the time it arrives. But anyway, regardless, most of you are aware of The Secret DJ. I am just mostly because of little extracts, I think, maybe taken from the book or other articles that were written and posted on, I think, Mixmag. It wasn't DJ Mag, but one of those sites. They posted little excerpts or a little kind of articles about, you know, how to conduct yourself, the nightlife, or just really cool stuff that you kind of would only get from somebody that has a lot of experience in the scene. I think whoever's behind it has got like 25 plus years experience, you know, uh, being a professional DJ or working within dance music or in the scene in general. And it's um, so far, again, I've only got, you know, a quarter of the way through. I'm just going to try and probably finish it by the end of the week. But it's a really good read, right? Really, really good read. Um, I love how it just starts off straight away, kind of giving you an overview of a day in the life of a DJ, like what kind of goes on, thoughts and feelings, um, how, you know, um, how this all affects your overall gig in different locations and the many different, you know, characters you meet along the way and it got me thinking about the whole Daniel Wang and Peggy Goo situation um about why exactly what did it get me? yeah that's what it got me thinking it got me thinking about the Daniel Wang aspect of it right because Daniel Wang for the most part everyone's sort of surprised by his um outburst against Peggy because he generally seems like a fairly sensible guy he t- speaks quite knowledgeably about the scene he's very well respected um of course you know um he's a great artist in his own right um a pretty decent DJ too so it's just odd to hear somebody who has that level of notoriety that level of um you know relevance in a scene who's kind of you know got his own sort of uh, niche that he sort of occupies to be offended and to be upset or bent or the nose put out of shape because of Peggy. You would maybe expect it more from somebody that's within her scene who's been working maybe longer than her. You kind of kind of be like, hey, that's unfair. How come she's getting that spot and I'm not, right? But you don't really think they exist in the same world. And then it also got me thinking a little bit about Playgraves, right? About um, why there seems to be uh, no shortage of really, really high level DJs playing Playgraves. I think for the most part, we could all understand if you're a local hero, somebody that you know that plays in, you know, uh, in your town, in your city, um, who's really good and decides to put on a Playgrave or decides to go play somewhere at a Playgrave because for the most part, you would imagine they don't really earn as much as a professional DJ and they still sort of like working their way up the ladder. So in order to kind of, you know, make sure they keep the roof over their head and put a meal on the table, you can kind of rationalize why they'd want to take the risk of, you know, maybe, you know, infecting numerous people with COVID or whatever it may be and spreading the virus and just causing some unto do harm. Because um, I think most of the harm with the playgraves doesn't necessarily come from the cases because you would imagine, you know, it depends on how you believe it. If you believe that COVID is, what's that thing called? Um, if it's, if the transmission rate is really high, if you believe that, um, depends. There's different bits of science out there that's saying the transmission level isn't as high as people think it is you just get sick or you don't um but regardless right um most of the i think damage that comes from playgraves comes from just the optics of it because i don't think it helps for collective adherence when you're seeing other people that live in the same city that you are in partying and having fun it doesn't necessarily um it doesn't necessarily help you to obey the rules or the new restrictions or to abide by whatever it may be right? it just makes it difficult and when that makes it difficult so it sows you know a seed of doubt a, a seed of um um yeah just seed of doubts and then you add conspiracies on top of it and it just gets all crazy in it so they don't really they don't really justify an ends and it and they probably make things worse in general right whether from a health and from a societal point of view but then it also got me i was also kind of always wondering from the beginning of you know the playgraves like why is it that all these really big people that are like you know the top 10 top 20 djs voted in the world who play like crazy places and fly in private jets and generally you would imagine just from looking from the outside looking in especially because people in the dance music scene are super gossipy and everyone talks about money and who does what and who's a who's a who's a cane and who's not you definitely get an idea about what people kind of make in terms of gigs that they play so if you're kind of thinking okay this person xyz person makes like between anywhere between five thousand to thirty thousand per gig right and they've been playing or they've been djing professionally at that level for like 15 years 
it would you would be within your right to be like hmm why are they playing in a play grave somewhere in the middle of a desert where people have to stand in hula hoops when they've clearly got the money to survive a, a year right you'd think that at the most right especially including the productions and the streams they're doing it just doesn't make any sense then i read this you know the first chapter or two of the secret dj and it all made sense to me there is something very addictive it feels like being a superstar dj being a pro dj like the and it doesn't necessarily have to do with the playing it's everything around it the lifestyle of going to an airport catching a flight sitting in business class maybe getting a private jet the ritual of what you do when you're on that plane when you get off the plane meeting your contact at the venue going to the hotel preparing yourself what you do at the hotel before you get there get into the venue itself um you know i'm um, talking to the dj that's playing before you communicating with the you know his entourage happens being a dj booth maybe you're getting vibed out by them you know in indulging yourself on your in your rider whatever it may be it seems like especially the first chapter or two where he sort of like speaks he sort of breaks down the entire day of playing an international gig i think it might have been in ibiza if i remember correctly and he sort of documents it from like i'm gonna say 5 p.m the day before the night before basically in london flying out to ibiza and what happens and it's essentially this whole section here right that i'm showing in the screen and it definitely it opened my eyes up to thinking oh these guys aren't playing because they need the money which you know the money i guess is a great bonus because i'm sure a lot of people are playing these playgrounds are probably playing for a reduced fee because you know mm, I, I i don't want to assume Right, you you'd think you'd assume that it would be a reduced fee, but it wouldn't surprise me if they were getting the same amount because they, they can just command it. It is what it is. The game is the game. It wouldn't surprise me. Some of the super agents, you know, the people that are signed to like WME and CAA, they're just saying, "Hey, fuck you, pay me. If you don't want to pay the fee, you're not going to get the person." But it definitely opened my eyes up to think, you know what? These playgraves are DJs are definitely playing because they're just addicted in the same way that we are as punters to the feeling of like just going out because i think a lot of us i think i can speak for myself in that regard yeah it's great to see people play i think in london we're quite spoiled that way in major most major markets major cities you are spoiled in terms of lineups and where you can go but for the most part it's less really about the person you're going to see because you know generally most nights are going to be like a five to a six out five upwards out of ten right you're never going to really going to get a real two out of ten event it's very rare that happens um promoters aren't going to risk their reputation to throw a, that kind of event because they know you just won't come back because there's loads of options that you can go to but most of the reason why you're going is because of the whole thing in it it's the whole vibe right um you know it, it's the it's the pre thing it's the meeting up with your friends it's the tra it's the jokes on the train before there it's the queuing up it's the toilet shit it's the conversation you have in a smoky room those are the same those are the things you sort of look forward to so i'd imagine on the dj side of things that's the thing that they look forward to as well right because you know imagine if you're a big dj you're probably playing you know especially during festival season or you know or when a busy peak season you're playing loads of different markets at the same time back to back to back there's not really much time to really sort through your music so you're probably playing the same set recycled a few times here or there maybe with addition of a couple of tunes so the music isn't really that exciting it is don't get me wrong but it doesn't really put the kick doesn't really uh, light a fire up there as, as it should so part of the thing that you're actually looking forward to is maybe bumping into your peers at the airport um seeing a manager or an agent or a booker or whatever that you like right uh linking up with a dealer that happens to be your friend now uh whatever it may be those are the things that you actually enjoy and you get addicted to and it's quite hard to break that addiction especially even more so during a global pandemic when legitimately you have no other use right because what else are these going to do now what else can they do legitimately they could maybe teach courses online they could maybe i don't know listen to people's demos that's about it right they have no use to society or to themselves probably um you know the they don't feel useful unless they're behind a deck playing somewhere so that may be as part of it why are they doing it because again i'm just thinking about it the other day i was like hold on ne again not watching anyone's pockets but nina kravish just got a massive gig right doing the whole cyberpunk thing probably got paid a pretty penny to make that work and loads of other events in italy in the middle of the summer like why is she still playing these weird events in the middle of the uae but then it makes sense so again monetarily i'm sure those events are gonna you know pay for two or three years of inactivity and also it's just addictive in it they just can't get enough they just don't want to be at home staring at their shadow they'd rather be in an airport somewhere waiting for a flight and um, waiting for someone to pick them up at an airport to go to the hotel all these things are essentially part of their identity and they can't 
let that go switch it over it just is what it is so that might be a reason to explain it but regardless um i really do think you should check out the book I, again the, the book number two i don't think is out at the moment um that's sorry, it's not in stock it's out but it's not in stock from from what i checked on amazon recently again i pre-ordered mine maybe the beginning of december maybe the end of november and it, it was due to come out it was due to come out is due to deliver on about the 12th of december and it never did because it was out of stock so i guess i must have been one of the last people to put a pre-order in and other people got prioritized so now i'm going to get it on sometime in the end of january but still check check out the first one anyway for the time being it's a great great book um loads of great little anecdotes and stories in there maybe give you another understanding or another perspective of what's going on um again it's, i don't think it's going to make you have sympathy for these people playing in places and getting paid you know 15 grand to play during the pandemic i'm not sure it's going to do that but it's just going to maybe give you a perspective on what's going on and why these really big people are going out and essentially putting loads of people at risk just so they can kind of like soothe their ego to some point right so definitely check it out the secret dj book one but i just think it's called secret dj just the yellow one anyway